those were the, that's probably the 12 months that kind of changed my career from that social life basketball. That's the reason why I played basketball. It was fun being around guys. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm playing as Tony Kukoc and Dino Raja and these NBA stars. But somehow you survive. Yes, it took a lot out of me. I was not a normal 23 year old coming out of college, uh, but it was still, um, you know, it, it certainly shaped me as a person a lot. Does that 15 minutes, let's say you play one game a week, that 15 minutes of, of uh, playing time mean more than 10 hours of practice during the week? Well, that's a stupid question. We didn't practice to feel great on, on, a, on a game day. We practice to get better and to be as mistake free as possible. So I didn't have what you call the fresh legs until maybe the last two weeks of season. Um, but yeah, you learn to be on time because at there you did not want to be late. That was, uh, and I know, you know, he sent some freshmen who come in, be late twice. They're gone, they're done. You know, when you're in practice, go full out. You in classroom, go full out. If, if you're there, you have a double Swedish class, Monday morning, you're tired. You're still gonna be there, why don't you do the best job you can be, we can do, rather than just sit there for two hours and learn nothing. Not even after a lot, if I play bad, I'm struggling mentally so bad until the next practice. So was my NBA two years disappointment? Absolutely. But but the reasons were kind of in my head. But at that time, I didn't understand it was in my head. I wanted something that didn't exist in, in the professional sports. I am Tommy and this is Surfer of Life. Today's guest is Hanno Möttelä, the first Finnish NBA and EuroLeague player. You have also played in the national team for almost two decades. And now you're a coach in the Helsinki Basketball Academy and Finnish Basketball Association. Welcome Hanno to Surfer of Life. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I know this detail that uh, you like to cook food especially during the week when it's maybe a little bit boring or just a regular weekday. Can you share one speciality? I don't know if I have a speciality. Um, I just bought a new uh, little advertisement. I bought a big green egg grill. Went back from a uh, gas grilling back to a uh, coal grilling this summer. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, I think the whole cooking comes from, I think one, I kind of started getting into and really appreciating good food back when I moved to States in college. And then uh, I was in the NBA, life on the road. You, know, you go to city to city, hotel to hotel, but then in the NBA, there's no really meals that you eat together as a team. It's, you can go out on your own, you're teammates. So uh, we used to have a couple of guys, teammates that we go out and uh, pick good restaurants. And uh, um, so that that's, kind of appreciation for good food and now that I have more time you know cooking it is good but uh I think you know I can I can always uh grill a pretty good steak and make good risotto or just some plain things but I, I don't follow too many recipes if I have ideas maybe I see on, on a tv show or on a cooking book or something I read but then I don't go back and follow the recipe to a tea I just and Maybe it's crazy, but I don't even taste the food too much before I put it on a, you know, on a plate. So I, 
you know, maybe I, I uh, want to get it right the first time and then uh, kind of like, you know, in sports, you can't go back in time. Okay, this doesn't, doesn't taste good. I need to, you know, I just put whatever I think it's good and it comes out. Just follow your instincts. Yeah. Yeah. We are here to talk about uh, basketball and your career and uh, basketball overall and how it is going in Finland. And all of us have a history and a start for every sport and whatever. How about you as a kid? Were you a very active child or what did you do? I child? was. I was lucky. I had a, well, I still do a, a unbelievable big brother, Matthias. He's three years older. Um, my parents weren't, they were great sport fans, especially my father. Uh, has notebooks from Olympic Games from way back when and he still remembers the bronze medal time for 1500 meters back in 50s in Olympic or 60s in the Olympics so kind of that kind of sports geek but not athletic in any way but uh, I followed my my big brother who um, didn't get the height genes that I got so I, I was able to kind of blend in with the older guys as a three year younger uh, I was always the goalie, where it was in hockey or, or soccer or whatever. Um, uh, and actually, I mean, I, I kind of, I always like, uh, I know you were a hockey goalie. I, I love the gear that you put on, a, allowed to be a hockey goalie or, or a soccer goalie. I was a, I started as a soccer goalie as a little kid. So I followed my big brother um, to his basketball practice one day when I was six and, and the team was nine. They practice right close right next to our house and um, um, you know they only had nine players and then the coach said at the end you know you want to come in and be the tenth guy so we can go five on five you know so there I am six year old little kid with the jeans on and and then probably for the I don't know if my brother was happy but then two days later I came back for the practice and now I had shorts on so that's how my basketball career started um, and I played with the older guys for other kids for three years and then I wasn't until I, I turned 10 that 9 and 10 um, when I got the first time when I played with my my own age level so but I was playing uh, soccer at, at uh, Kappa and then uh, basketball it was a Capilan Pantri the team and then moved to YMCA when that local little team where my brother and I played it kind of just ended you think it's good for the juniors, for the child to have multiple different sports? Oh, it's there's no question. I think it's absolutely terrible. Even have the conversation that that uh, uh, you have to choose a sport when you're six or seven because there's so many practices. I understand there's there's certain sports, figure skating, women's gymnastics, where you have a chance to win Olympic gold when you're 15, 16, and the career ends when you're 20, 22. Those I understand that it's a different deal, but overall, we at the Finnish Basketball Association we hope, and and it's written in our rule and the guide for the for the coaches around the country, that we hope that the, everybody, all every girl and boy have a hopefully two or three other sports all the way up to 13, 14 year old, because it only helps with coordination, help your body control, your mind. I, I mean, I played, I only played soccer and basketball organized but i've counted uh for one presentation i did maybe five years ago i think i came up with 28 different sports that i've practiced i actually gone to somewhere to do it whether it's go high jumping at, at elanta track and field or ping pong or Whatever. I mean, I came up with 28 different sports that I've gone and, you know, I was fortunate to have unbelievable PE teacher at school, uh, Jorma Rikala, who's a uh, EF call legend, ex-coach. I mean, he taught us how to, how to uh, shot put, how to run, how to jump, how to do gymnastics, everything from third grade on, you know, so I'll, I'm, I'm really blessed to have that because it helped my coordination. Um, so. Yes, I've only played two sports, but I can say I've played multiple sports and I can, I guess I have pretty good hand-eye coordination. So if you give me a new sport, I can come up with it within, within a day. So it helped, obviously. This is the message I get from a lot of like successful athletes, even whatever sports. So while well, you're doing it as a coach, but you think it would be very wise and uh, 
important for these athletes that made it big time to tell the coaches more and the players or athletes or whatever that this is an important issue? Well, absolutely. But I think there's there's enough studies that have done. And you don't you don't even need studies. There's to be honest, I think there's there's too many studies that people rely on now. It, it has to be common sense. Um, I think one thing that makes it hard is our sports culture. Everything happens in the clubs. It's afternoon. It's not always right next to your house. It's not always even a five or ten minute walk. It might be forty five minute bus ride. So it's tough for have different sports, but also junior coaches, especially in team sports. They're shooting for, you know, for championships with the girls and boys who are 10, 12, 14 year old. Yes, it, it's on average, it's it's not more. It's nicer to win than lose, but I don't think winning a 14 year under 14 Finnish championship should be a goal of any coach. I, I think if 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 that happens as a as a product of of playing, practicing right way, multiple different sports. Developing these little girls or little boys as an athlete, then that comes up, especially in our sport, because if you start adding tactics, it's you can win basketball basketball games with a lot worse athletes, and it's kind of dangerous because if if you have a 13, 14 year old team and you spend all your time with practicing tactics, 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 you can win these championships, and then people think you're a great coach and these are great players, but then four years later. No one even knows where those kids are because nothing came out of them. So it's a it's a two-edged sword. It, it's we want to win, but who who's brave enough to look five years ahead? That hey, maybe I can help this girl developing now, and and she can be good in five years. You think, especially in Finland, we, it's a small country that uh, too many uh, different sports are kind of fighting to get the best athletes. From the country yeah I, I think well I think not I mean these days it's it's team sports are obviously dominating especially in the cities um, so there's there's must be a, a big I don't know if it's a crisis but for the for the uh, associations of, of individual sports you have to be scrambling to find kids um, obviously media has a lot to do with it kids can see Hockey takes gets a lot of media time, so a lot of kids want to do it. Um, then, obviously, the success we've had, we just hosted the European Championship with basketball. You know, we run into a positive problem that we don't have enough coaches, not enough, enough gym time, or enough referees to, you know, to take all the kids in. So um, so now now the government, the, the local city, city uh, organized they got to come in and we got to figure out can we start building new practice facilities you know i know hockey probably needs more ice time so it's we kind of outgrown even helsinki we've outgrown our city uh, there's so many little little kids who want to start a sport and it's i mean it's, it's not if it's not right if a 10 year old need to practice at eight or nine o'clock in the after at night during the week so um it is a fight for athletes, but I think I think it'd be great if uh, if more and more sports would understand. Let's say the under fourteen year olds, they would start working things together. Like it's okay if you go there two times a week and you're with us two times a week. It doesn't, you know, it's not going to affect your minutes during the Saturday when we play. But I don't. How many coaches are brave enough to do it? What was uh, what was the point that you realized that basketball is really your game? Is is your thing? Probably. I mean, I, I think when I start figuring out that I can, I can be pretty good at it. You know, as a, as a little kid, obviously you want to do better and and get better. But all the way up to, I, I want to say, all the way up to high school age, which might sound, sound crazy these days, I did sports so I can enjoy being around my friends, that, that camaraderie, that whether it's on the floor or off the floor or, or pre on soccer, you know, on the pitch or, or off, it was a way for me to hang out and have fun with, with friends. 
Um, I was lucky, lucky to have also as a basketball player, unbelievable teammates and my as my best friends. You know, they were the best in in the country. Again, yes, it, we won. You know, we won junior national championships, and back then it was a great thing for us. But just like what I said five minutes ago, now if I look back, yes, there are great memories, but. But I don't know if those if it was those things that made me an NBA player. It was the thing that I was able to practice and be around the best players in my age group. Um, so that was a. I think I was 12, 11 or twelve when I I quit soccer, organized, um, and I was a, I was a goalie. And then when we start having goalie practices during the winter. And so I questioned, like, why I have to go to different practice, but the other guys don't have to practice. You know, maybe a stupid idea, but back then there wasn't, it wasn't this culture where you, you can have individual practices. Now it's probably they have individual goalie practices when you're five, I assume. But uh, so that was kind of end of it. But it was also, I played soccer kind of with my, my school friends. And then basketball happened in Pakila, which was a totally other group of guys. So then when my social life starts shifting towards that, that's when I kind of quit soccer. And But again, we, especially in the summertime, the, I mean, the best basketball players at that time in the country, if it means anything of 12, 13, 14 year olds, practice was over. We went in and, you know, we played different kind of street, street soccer, came up with own sports. So it was... It was not just an hour and a half in the gym. We played competitive sports <laughs> the whole day. But in basketball, you actually came to be a very good player. And you said already that you won these junior championships, that you were only 17 when you put, participated in the 22-year-old European final tournament. How did it change you as a player or did it change you as a person at all? Well, the story was I was spending my exchange student year in San Antonio, Texas. And um, Henrik Detman was the coach for the under 22 year old team. And he called me, I want to say in March and asked, would you cut your exchange student year by about almost two months and come back to Helsinki and try out for the team of a four year older guys. And these days, if, if, 17 year old would, would try to get into a four year older guy's team parents would probably say no it's not good for him emotionally or it's fit. I, I didn't even think about it I was like yeah I do it and probably after that I called my mom and dad like yes I know you and the grandparents you paid for this exchange student year it's probably 20,000 marks or something like that but you know I, I kind of decided I, I want to come back home end of May and, and or middle of May and try out for the team it was just trying out not to make the team so um by it kind of shows that i some deep inside i was just kind of able to make the right decisions you know i i didn't hesitate so i came back home and, and uh, i was able to make the team and that's probably when the college recruiting started in my part and um you know it was good i mean i, I was able to compete and actually help the team a little bit and then a year later, I played uh, at the Men's European Championships back in 1995 as an 18-year-old. So those were the, that's probably the 12 months that kind of changed my career from that social life basketball. That's the reason why I played basketball. It was fun being around guys. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm playing as Tony Kukoc and Dino Raja and these NBA stars. You know, it's, that's when it kind of things changed for me. How did it feel? Do you still remember that first time you step on the court in the European Championships wearing the Finnish national jersey? Yeah, I mean, we, we it was a big, it's a big arena. It's still out there in Athens. Um, kind of what eased my nerves was we went in a few weeks earlier and we played Greece there three times. So I started my national team career against Greece has 17 points in the second game as a 17 year old. Um, big gym, not too many fans. I think there was maybe nine or 20, 12 fans from Finland back in there at Athens. Then fast forward, 
19 years in Bilbao, there's 10,000 Finnish fans. So I've seen the start and the, and the not the end, but the current situation. Um, I didn't play well there, although I was a second leading rebounder um, behind uh, um, Lauri Markkanen's dad, Pekka. Um, and probably looking back, if I would have shot the ball better, I, I don't know where my career would have gone because I could have easily averaged 12, 10, 12 points a game as a 18 year old. And then what would have happened? Um, you know, I mean, yes, I got some offers a year later from, uh, from around Europe, but, uh, um, and then also if, if NBA was then what it is now, I would have been drafted automatically, probably first round out of Europe this skinny dude who can run and, and jump a little bit and shoot and but that's not the way NBA was back then so um, it wasn't an option for me. How was it back then? Were you nervous before, before the games? I didn't know enough of basketball so I wasn't too nervous. I didn't know about the, all the tactical things uh, you know what what is a good or what is it not not a good shot. In a way it was basketball was a lot easier to play back then because I didn't think too much um, but um, so I, I was just playing. I was just playing, and I was probably pretty selfish. Um, I know. I think if you talk to the older guys on that team, they probably look at me as who is this eight-year-old kid who comes in and tries to shoot every time. Then I got coached a lot, you know, in college for four years, and then became maybe a little too unselfish. So if I if I could have had that selfishness I had as a ki as a young player when I got to the NBA I, I probably would have a lot longer NBA career because in the NBA you you have to be looking for your own own shot and, and for your own things that's just it's just that's the way the business works. Let's talk about the times in university. You went to Utah, and you already mentioned that it was changing your mentality a little bit that, that you were selfish and then we were not selfish at all and there should be something between. What was the difference in USA compared to Finland when you went there? Well, I, I remember uh, I told uh, Helsing in Sanama, uh reporter after my freshman year of the summer that our coaching staff in Utah knows more about basketball than, than all the Kodis League, uh, top league, Finnish coaches together. And our, our national team coach at the time, R. McCarthy, kind of got mad at me. But that was an understatement. I mean, the the amount of knowledge that I received in the first three months, I, I, I was I was amazed. I, I thought like I'd never been coached before. I mean, just the terminology, different things, the level of detail. Okay, I never had that kind of level of detail from coaching before or after that. So did it go overboard? Probably a little bit, but but we were one unbelievable team. Um, so it, it was a it was truly a universal university degree in basketball. It wasn't a place where I just went and played. And I mean, it was every day was a physical and psychological test. It was a grind brutal in a lot of ways brutal four years i would not you know i would not send my my son to there to play for coach majors but i would do it again in a heartbeat it's it's one of those things that um you know we now we're having a 20-year anniversary of our final four run um this this season and and it's you know it's it's the best group of guys i've ever ever been around it's it's the only team with a capital t that I've been around. The only thing that gets close is our national team, the way we were able to build it. But still, there's nothing nothing compared to the one four-year experience I had at, at college. What do you think were the best lessons you got from out of that four years? Um, I thought I was able, I was practicing hard. I thought I gave everything I had when I was in Finland. And again, looking back, I mean, I was an 18-year-old player who was able to compete at the European Championship level. I went there and I understood that I was going maybe at 70% tops. 
okay, the normal level of of fraxing ends at maybe 90, 85. What we did is is uh, it was something different. Was it physically very smart by today's standards? Absolutely not. We didn't we didn't we didn't practice to feel great on on a, on a game day. We practice to get better and to be as mistake free as possible. So I didn't have what you call a fresh legs until maybe the last two weeks of season. It, it was, I mean, I, I can remember, I mean, the whole body cramping up. I mean, the longest practice I probably ever had before was maybe two hours. You know, in Helsinki, as you know, there's every, you rent a gym time, it's maybe 90 minutes. When the 90 minutes over, the next group comes in. And there, we had a gym as long as coaches wanted. So whether it was three hours, it might have gone three and a half hours. My first weekend of praxis as a freshman, it started on a Saturday. It was two, three, three and a half hour praxis. Saturday, same Sunday. And I'm, I'm thinking like, this is absolutely crazy. I, and then how demanding it was, it was, but somehow you survive. Yes, it took a lot out of me. I was not a normal 23 year old coming out of college, uh, but it was still, um, you know, it, it certainly shaped me as a person a lot. Was it the coach that made the difference or is it the whole culture in USA that it's Co like that in different... Yeah, in, in college, especially in, in college yeah, basketball, coach. but in, in college football, it's, it's coaches who run the program. That's the reason a lot of times why some player commits to a college, it's the coach. In the NBA, players run the teams. Um, so yes, it was automatically, it, it was, we had a dictatorship. There was no, if coach showed up 15 minutes early, that's when practice started. If coach showed up for whatever reason, 45 minutes later, late, that's when practice started. There was, it, we were on his schedule. Uh, again, is it a, the way he, all the studies show you should coach these days? No, absolutely not. It was as old school as you can go. But as far as the basketball knowledge, there's nothing like that I've, I've, that I've experienced since. And uh, now it's it's in a lot of ways. It's I still use a lot of the game hasn't the way game is played is changed a lot in 20 years. By the individual techniques, the the level of details that you need to have in certain things that hasn't changed and that's you know i was able to get a better coaching and get better teaching on those things than probably anywhere in the world i understand that you only missed once or been late one time in your whole career from practice did you learn that you need to really be on time as you said the coach was demanding or have you always been like that it's my personality I mean, if I was looking that I was going to be late to school, I would hustle as hard as I can. You know, you start getting that bad feeling in your stomach if I'm late. Um, and I think it's also kind of finished thing. You know, it's, you know, if you say, let's meet quarter or five somewhere, Finnish people are usually quarter or five there. Uh, but yeah, I, the, the rules at Utah, and basically if you were, if you were not 15 minutes early, you were late. Because like I said, if coach showed up 10 minutes early, that's when team that's when it started. Yes, we say we start practice at 12.30. But if he was there at 12.15, that's when practice started. So um, and you did not want to let your teammates down. Um, we didn't get punished as a team. It wasn't like, okay, s someone screws up, everybody line up, now we're running. It was if you screw up, you're the one who run. The rest of the guys, practice goes. And I actually like it because it's okay. Sometimes if as a team, we screw up something, yes, the team runs and all that. But, um, so you usually our three, hour practice, it was one guy was running constantly. Um, but yeah, you learn to be on time because at there you did not want to be late. That was, um, uh, and I know, you know, he sent some freshmen who come in be late twice. They're gone. They're done. That you you can end your career 
and it's still the same. I mean, if, you, if you're late in 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 practices in in states, it's it's a rule. You do you, do, you are not late. I mean, it, it just isn't. I mean, and um, and only time I've been late was in Moscow, and that was due to a traffic. And I wasn't the only one that the coaches understood that. Um, so, uh, and I take a lot of pride of it, uh, pride on that, and. That's one of the things we try to teach our high school kids now at, at uh, HBA. I mean, try to be the first one in the gym and try to be the last one to leave. But again, in Finland, a lot of times when the practice time ends, that's when you got to leave the gym because the next group comes in. The 60 year old volleyball team comes in. So uh, it's hard in a lot of ways to teach young players in Finland those habits that you need when you leave Finland because a lot of times you can't come in the gym 30 minutes early and you know try to work on your technique or or try to you know work on your or your uh, technique shots or wh whatever it's because there's no time someone is practicing until your time starts and then someone comes in right after you you end so it's a lot of times when our guys kids go to college that's the first time that they have the luxury of the gym is open basically 24/7 Obviously, that four years was also mentally very tough. Did you have any mental coaching during those years? Our mental coaching was uh, you try to look at the head coach in the eye and take everything he says, um, which was a lot of that was not printable. It was not for kids. And then the assistant coaches were the ones who kept us going. And uh, really, and for that reason, those the two coaches, our head coaches, he passed away probably four years ago. Um, the two assistant coaches are still very, very dear to me because those were the ones who kept us sane. I mean, they, without those two people on the court or off the court, it was it wasn't doable. So no, there was no there was no uh, sports psychologist back then. Uh, but it was us. I mean, we we didn't fight as a team. We didn't do any. It was we had a great chemistry because we knew that it was in a lot of ways it was the players against the coach, or you know, not in a negative way, but he, he was the one who who you know punished us. We had, if we need to be punished for whatever reason, and we needed kept together. So it wasn't a situation where a lot of the pro teams I played for. You know, there's fighting in the in the teams, or there's you know those guys don't like these guys we knew that wasn't if we did that we had no chance because it was so demanding during practices uh, so it was the assistant coaches and the trainer that's where i learned that the trainer is really you know the or well, here in finland we kind of call, we call it physiotherapist or the guy who tapes your ankles and he's your psych psychologist that and it, it still is you know nothing nothing to take away the the professional sports psychologist. I, I I've I've used a few of them, but it's it usually in team sport is the trainer. If you want to know something about the mood of the players, the trainer is the one who knows, because he's the one who spends the kind of one on one time, whether it's just taping your ankles for five minutes every day, or giving you rehab for thirty minutes. That's where you have the best conversations. Um, so, um, and it, it's uh, and that's so. I didn't. I didn't have a. During my career, career there wasn't. A, not one pro team had a, had a psychologist. First time I I. Uh, I used one was uh, when I, I retired for the first time. Oh wait, and then decided to come back. I. Uh, wanted to kind of get my thoughts clear and and uh, had a great, great sessions and and. Uh, and we had one. Um, with the men's national team for the last probably five years. I understand that there's different ways of uh, kind of like expressing your emotions in the USA or really you can't show your emotions. If you screw up, if you throw your ball out or whatever, you make a mistake that you can really show it. Is it different there than here? It depends on a coach again. On the NBA level, it's it's a it's a entertainment business. so. It, we're not talking about NBA, but let's say in college, at Utah, we were not even allowed, only people who were allowed to even look at a referee were the captains. 
if you miss your shot and did any kind of motion, you were coming out. So yes, you know, it, it did turn us to a little bit like robotic in our, in our emotions, but also we didn't waste an ounce of energy to any kind of, we didn't waste our energy anything other than just doing what we're supposed to. I see a lot of kids who shoot it and then, ah, and then you lose that half a second and the game of basketball, it's so fast, you lose a half a second here. So that mistake, and then your your emotions, you're gonna lose the next situation. So, I mean, I'm all for showing your emotions. You know, you make a big shot. Yes, we were allowed, I mean, you make a big shot. You're allowed to, you know, at Utah, you're allowed to, you know, show your emotions that way, but but not, a, not yelling at the camera or, or, you know, after a great dunk or anything like that. Um, so, but it is, um, obviously with the time of social media, you do something, you know, the rest of the world is going to know it real quick. So back then, before social media, you were able to kind of do all kinds of things and no one other than the ones who were right there watching the game remember. Um, but yeah, we are we are negative people, Finnish athletes compared to American athletes. It's... A, here we don't even talk about too much. Even the term, I don't know what is a, what is it equivalent to uh, your body language in, in Finnish. I don't mean, yeah, kehon kieli, but it's not like body language. Something that it's taught a lot in in states, and they they talk about you know the people who are watching you. If you have a bad body language, it doesn't matter how good a basketball player you are, they might not sign you for their college or, or their, you know, if if it's fifty fifty between two guys who are great players for let's say for the NBA draft body language is something that if you have a bad, bad body language they don't take you um, so yeah they it, your personality probably comes through your uh, body language and uh, so probably because of my experience at Utah I kind of became stoic kind of uh, I, I didn't show a whole lot of emotions during my career but yes I started slowly and slowly getting rid of that and maybe going back to the pre-Utah. Um, so, uh, but it, it was an interesting kind of experience and that you can, you can learn really quickly if you have to do keep your emotions inside. After those four years, you got drafted. Second round for this pick. How did you feel when you got drafted? <laughs> Disappointed, but I, I knew it was, that's kind of probably going to happen because I was so injured my last year, my senior year. So I went from kind of locked first round top 15 pick the two years prior to a second round. But I was able to uh, really make the team. I, nothing was handed to me. I played well in the summer league and, um, you know, so it was a, but it wasn't as big of a thing for me because I, I lived there for four years, played in the big arenas, had a lot of publicity, played with great people had really good friends who I played with who gone to the NBA the previous three years. So it was just a natural next step for me. Um, and that's probably looking back, I didn't treat it as a special thing. Um, I kind of, because the college experience was so hard. And I, I remember I was like, okay, now I'm, I'm done. I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to do this brutal practicing anymore for the rest of my life. So I kind of let myself accept a, easily a step or two lower level of practicing the detail, I mean everything. And then, um, although I got a great opportunity to play at Atlanta, I was able to start, for example, my first three games. Um, we didn't have a coaching staff or culture, it was a new coach there. So they didn't have a culture in place where younger players are put into a you know, detailed practicing outside of the team practices, which kind of I needed that time. I wasn't, because we were pushed by a coach for four years, I wasn't able to go back to the kind of pre-Utah pre where I was not self-motivated, but like self, 
I did everything that was asked, but but you learn for four years that that four that that what you're asked to is, is enough. At U- Utah, we didn't have, you did not have energy to do anything extra. There was no, there was no chance you, you stayed and took 200 extra shots. You had zero energy. Now in today's basketball, it's normal for someone to you know, yeah, stay an hour later, but it it was impossible. So I went to NBA and kind of in my mind didn't realize it. I did everything that coach asked, but I didn't show up early in the practice, hour earlier to shoot or stay out later. I was happy I did. So I, so looking back, that was kind of my mistake. But then, you know, um, I wish we had a better individual training program um, that probably could have pushed me to stay in the NBA longer. Well, that was one difference between Utah and Atlanta in N- NBA. What about else? What are the things when you go to NBA and it's a big business also over there? So how was it different compared well, to Utah? When our college coach said that this is the last team that you're ever going to play for, you know, it came through. I mean, just like I said before, my college and national team were the only teams I ever played for. NBA, just like yearly teams I played for. Yes, we had great guys. We had some chemistry. We played well together, but it's still 12 guys. Everybody's their own company. Your goal is to play well to get a better and bigger contract next time. Unless you you're in a situation where everybody has a long contracts, then it's easier to put the individual goals on the side and shoot for team goals. And everybody comes from different cultures. So yeah, there was a lot of lot more fighting, a lot more chemistry issues, a lot more me, 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 a lot more why that guy, not why not me. Uh, you know, we had a coach who came in from uh, from college ranks and the older guys were trying to tell him, well, this is how it used to be done in, in, in the NBA. You know, for example, if you're injured, you're away for 10 games. And you were, you used to start, you were in starting five when you got hurt. You know, they're telling the coach, well, you know, the culture is that when you come back from being injured, you're automatically back in the starting lineup. Where our coach was like, no, these guys were playing well. We're not. So, you know, it was, I learned how lucky I was to actually have four years in my career, have that kind of perfect team. But um, maybe if I would have got coached a little bit less, I didn't know as much about basketball. If I didn't experience a perfect team chemistry, I might have been a better professional basketball player because of that. Because now I knew how things should have been done. And now I'm playing with these guys who are making tens of millions of dollars and they're acting like little kids. And it was, uh... but yeah, obviously unbelievable players, talent level. Um, Michael Jordan made his comeback. So be able to play against Michael Jordan and guys who I, grew up idolizing, had posters on the walls. It was uh, obviously a special time, but um, you know, it was still, it was still a, the, the game of basketball was not fun. Uh, it was very individualistic and, uh, uh, but I knew that going in. I had ex teammates from college who played for a couple of years already. And they, you know, they told me that the NBA that you grew up idolizing that doesn't exist you know it's it's a it's a whole different ball game how did you cope with the media a lot millions of spectators watching the games well uh, i played big time college ball so it wasn't too different uh, probably in college probably there's more people want to get my comments than in the nba um, so it was a it was a it's a ab- absolutely unbelievable lifestyle And again, I got lazy in a way. I enjoyed the lifestyle of, okay, you go from five-star hotel to five-star hotel. You know, we, okay, let's go. We Now we're going to Philadelphia. Hey, let's go to that great, great fish restaurant, you know, and, and try try that. And then, yes, you go and you play your hardest, but it's, you know, then that was one of the reasons why I I wanted to come back to Europe because I knew, It was a team game. I could have stayed in the NBA, get a 
one year contract. But I wanted to come back and play basketball kind of the way I I uh, I I wanted. I like to play. Yes, going back was it? Should I stay in the NBA? Yes, I, you know it was uh, again. Europe isn't. There's another another uh, group of problems or but things. But it was still the game of, in Europe. It was a lot more fun. Absolutely had unbelievable experiences. Lived in unbelievable places. Um, but um, but yeah. The, so the NBA experience was kind of it was a kind of two way thing. Unbelievable two years. Had great friends. Obviously played against. I mean, Hall of Fame players had a chance to actually play. It wasn't like I was just a reserve who played ten minutes. You know, I, I was a. I started some game. I was sixth, sixth or seventh man on a decent team. We won thirty plus games. Had some Hall of Fame players I played with. So, um, but yeah, I mean, was my NBA two years disappointment? Absolutely. But but the reasons were kind of in my head. But at that time, I didn't understand it was in my head. I wanted something that didn't exist in, in the professional sports. I already asked about the mental coaching in Utah. How was it in NBA? Was there anybody to talk to if things didn't go well? No, it was the same thing. It, it was teammates, the ones you kind of got close to. And then again, it was a trainer. Trainers were, and I'm still, the trainers are probably the ones I've, I always I'm closest to. Um, just got a message a few days ago from our trainer from Atlanta, uh, and uh, he's in another line of business now. And uh, so uh, um, there wasn't the whole this whole sports psychologist thing on the, at least on the basketball scene didn't come around until I moved back to Finland. Um, so. I don't think it exists in, in, in any way back then. And I, and I think in States, it's States is probably the last place where it's kind of accepted. It, it, it's the much more, more macho culture. Okay, if you talk to someone, sports psychologist, okay, he's a shrink, you know, what's wrong with you? Rather than, you know, you train your body on the court, why don't you train your brain off the court? I understand it now, but but back then, there was if someone would have gone and talked to psychologists you know it was it probably would have been a pretty big issue after that you went to europe spain was the first country right so how did it change you already mentioned about it a lot that it well, was more of a team yeah. sport was it like you were expecting no <laughs> no and i i it's the one mistake i made in my career that i signed with that particular club and, and that particular coach. Um, he was probably the most demanding coach in Europe. Not as demanding uh, as Rick Majors at college, but he was uh, in, a, in a just stupid, crazy, extremely unhealthy way of demanding. There was no positive. At Utah, it was still, everything was positive. Yes, coach, he might have yelled at you and called you all kinds of names. But then when the tracks is over, he truly wants to be your friend. Uh, this coach, uh, ex-Yugoslavian coach, he he had he didn't have any any <laughs> leak of positive in, in him. It was a, and um, so it was a it was a very bad experience. Um, and then uh, I got hurt there, and then the team gave me a fake MRI and fake X-ray and forced me to play with actually fractured ankle for four weeks and then I was able to get my release my release papers and December 13th I was able to fly home straight from Tel Aviv after playing 40 minutes in the EuroLeague game and, and uh, beating Tel Aviv um, I was able to fly home and that's probably one of my happiest days of my life because I was I, I, I was I was ready to quit basketball because they I've, I've gone through so much of training so hard that I did not deserve this kind of treatment. Um, so by then I was, you know, I couldn't train for th three months, four months, and, and uh, because of the ankle. Um, so uh, that was not a good experience. And because of that, that experience actually shaped me as a person a lot. It was such a deep, 
negative feel of betrayal that I, it changed me probably more than any one situation and, and unfortunately I became a lot more cynical I I didn't accept kind of new too many new people in my life or, or I was very hesitant to trust some coaches first um, because I you know I just you know when something like that happened when someone treats you and <laughs> And gives you a, a fake diagnosis on a severe injury you know it's a uh, it changes you as a person and uh <clears throat> but you know I, I know it wasn't the only for example there's been a, a, lot, a lot of argentinians who still play in the nba uh they they play for that coach and they had a clause in their contract after they left the program that if he ever comes to the team that they play they can quit the team right away. So, um, so I've experienced probably the most demanding college coach and the most demanding European coach, but the ch difference was night and day, absolutely night and day. That's crazy. I never heard that somebody was forced to play. I, I know some N NHL players that they want to play even with the well, little, I, little fractures, but I never heard of. They about ha this I, I had a tendonitis in my ankle, according to their. Uh, their diagnosis and the coach forced me to throw away the crutches after two days and after like seven days they forced me to start running straight uh, and, uh, so yeah it was a uh, but you know again uh, back then unfortunately FIBA didn't have the kind of legal representation they have now um, the team actually still owes me money <laughs> but I was just happy to get away from there um, yeah it was a it was a bad experience uh, but I fought through it, but because of that, I wasn't able to make the comeback to Europe because after I left the team, um, a couple of NBA teams wanted to sign me right away, but I couldn't, I was hurt <coughs> big time Euroleague teams wanted to sign me, but I, I couldn't. And then I went to, uh, I spent the next summer with Miami heat because I always played well against Miami and, uh, Pat Riley liked me. But I hadn't played organized basketball since December, and then I played probably the worst. That's the only, kind of the only time when I had to perform and I, I wasn't able to play well, kind of in my career. And I really blew a great opportunity. We already negotiated a contract with with Miami. I spent the whole summer there, and then I just go play with them with the national with the summer league that I've done with a couple of times in Atlanta. I go play there play the way I can and then we sign a contract and but I I just whatever reason I uh, you know it was eight months since the last time I played organized ball seven months and I just played bad and and, uh, and then I kind of turned the corner and understood okay I didn't concentrate on European career and uh, had a great great run in, in Europe how heavy was it after that to get back in the game that you had this huge disappointment. Of course, the coach was forcing you to play with a busted ankle or busted bones, and then you go back to Miami and kind of thinking like you're going back to NBA and everything's just blown away. How tough and heavy was it? That well, it, it was tough. It was tough. Um, but um, just, I mean, I, I knew if I played for better, I would have I would have signed with them. Um, so, uh, um, and it was actually my my college teammate that then came later in the fall and and si signed with them. Uh, <coughs> but I, I I got over. I had to make a f decision in my head that okay now now I'm gonna really because the first in Spain I was there physically but mentally I signed in Europe to to get some real real playing time and get back to the NBA. You know, so my head was somewhere else. Um, um, and it was actually funny. The first t game I played in Spain, the Mi Miami were kind of negotiating with my agent that they want to bring me and sign me right then. But I didn't have a, I didn't have a buyout. But we we're like, okay, just play, f play this first game and let's see if we can somehow negotiate. So I'm going in into my first Euroleague game as like, okay, you know. Hopefully, you know, I'll play this and hopefully I can leave the Miami in a couple of days. 
So I was mentally just in the absolutely wrong place. And I, I, it became, it was probably one of my best games of my career. I was the MVP of your league that week. And, and that just shows you that, you know, mental preparation, there's no right way. I, I had 30 some points and I don't know, 12 rebounds against uh, Maccabi and just destroyed them on my own. So that shows you that uh, mental, mental, there's all kinds of uh, mental stages you can be in and still perform well. About the preparation, did you have any methods before the games? Did you do some specific things? As a younger player, I had some. I remember when I still played in Finland in Korea's League before I went to Utah. I had like I kept my other sock uh, high until the tip off, and then I then I roll it down just like Michael Jordan used to play with. Um, but not I'm not superstitious in that kind of way. Um, but um, probably later, the older you start getting, you start getting rid of those things or they just become habits that you don't even understand you do it. I mean, did I tie my shoes right first or left? I probably do the same way, but I think everybody does it. Um, <coughs> so, um, I don't think I had really any kind of mental preparations. I, I did have, for a national team, I, I think it started from the first summer on. Um, during the national anthem, kind of during the last verse, I kind of, you know, I, I was singing until that, and then I kind of closed my eyes and, and imagined this situation where actually Karepeka Klinga pa pass, passed me the ball, and then I do this. And it, it kind of, I don't think I, if I did always, but then I, it kind of came back to me again these last few years with the national team. So that was kind of some, you know, somehow I try to get in some kind of mood. But basketball is such a high paced game that so little things, so few things can be planned ahead. You have to react to the moment. So it's not like, I mean, I'm not a figure skater, but let's say in figure skating, you practice one program your whole season, so you can kind of go over it, or or uh, ski jumping or something. It's the same situation over and over again. Basketball, you have ten thousand situations what can happen to you. So for me, for me, this I was in good mental health, if you can say that when I was in great physical shape. That's when I had confidence. So for me, confidence is, it's first physical, and then it becomes mental. You're teaching this confidence for your athletes, now when you're a coach. Are there certain methods or something that you do with building their self-confidence way bigger than they have now? I think we as a Finn, we, we never realize how good we can be. I, I don't think I, I realized how could have actually, I could have become, and that's the reason why I didn't maybe become that. That's why I'm so happy that, you know, I watched Lauri Markkanen, and it's like, he's doing everything that I was unintentionally scared to do. I had, I had unbelievable skill set. But I was scared to do what I can do. And he wasn't, you know, I was shaking. It was just, I did the things that I was asked and, and that's it. So I, I teach our guys, well, I don't teach. I mean, it's, it's a, we try to tell our guys that, you know, that to, the things that you train, you try to, try to do those things in games, but you have to practice them first. So again, it, it's if you're physically good, meaning you have repetitions in practice, go ahead and do them in, in a game. Um, shooting. So, so for me, again, it starts if, if you have good mechanics, you can trust your shot. Obviously, basketball is a game, is a sport where you, the purpose is to put the ball in the basket. So shooting is a vital part. These days, it's 
<laughs> it's probably it's the biggest part of the game. I mean, it really, if you cannot shoot these days, it's hard to play basketball. 20 years ago, you can have big muscles and just be a big physical presence. That was enough. These days, everybody has to be able to shoot, especially in Europe. So I think the best way I can help our guys to have confidence is to teach them the detailed mechanics of shooting, for example. I think that's something that I was taught extremely well at Utah. I had natural skills for that. So that's something I, I relate to our players. Um, not just, okay, just repetition, repetition. I don't, yes, repetition is great, but I'd much rather have you take 20 good shots with good technique than 200 shots with bad. Because with bad technique, your, your ceiling is somewhere here. With good technique, it goes somewhere here. So, no, I'm not a mental coach as of let's, let's sit down here one-on-one, -on -one, you know, let's have, I have these magical techniques. I, you know, it, it, that doesn't happen. But we, we try to encourage them to do things that they don't realize they can do. Our motto at, at the association, especially our Susi, Susi Yengi program is be as good as you can be. And that kind of sums it up. Because I don't think too many Finns are trying to be as good as you can be. Whether it's a bus driver, is, he, is every bus driver trying to be as good as you can be? Including when everybody comes in, you say hello, you, you're happy, you, they just do their job. Nothing against bus drivers. Or is every athlete trying to be as good as they can be? And that's, that's, that's a skill. Um, so if... I can help our guys, high school age kids, to do that. Uh, I think that's that's the most mental coaching I can give them. What do you think about practicing versus games? Should there be more games? If you think about because game is actually what matters, or is it practicing what matters? Like you say, a lot of repetitions. What's your, your opinion? When an adult level, the games matter. You go you go play professionally. Any sport. The coach's job is not to develop you, especially if you're not a native guy. Let's say if a Finnish player goes to Spain, coach's job is not to develop you. Their job is to win the game. There's no extra time on the practice for you to shoot and get better. They do things they need to do to win games. But if we talk about high school age, younger, yes, you need to have enough games Everybody wants to play, and, and that, that's the fun part of it. But if we can make the practice as a game day, that's another motto. Our, our slogan at the HBA is, every day is a game day. So if, if every practice is like a game, when there's a, if, whether it's in the basketball, one-on-one, two-on-two, or three-on-three -three drill, if you treat that as a last game of the season, isn't that might be even more fun than the game. You can have a lot more of those every week. Um, there's a saying in Finland that you can only learn to play by playing games, which I think is absolutely crazy. And the parents love this. If their their son or their daughter is not playing enough, they they call or email the coach, why is my daughter or son not playing more? But if they truly want to get better as a player as a, and as a person, does that 15 minutes, let's say you play one game a week, that 15 minutes of, of uh, playing time mean more than 10 hours of practice during a week? Well, that's a stupid question. Do you get better doing the 15 minutes or the 10 hours? So, yes, we want to win games at HBA, but our main goal is to develop better players and to develop that way, Finnish basketball. Our goal is to make them senior men's national team players. And it doesn't happen this year, it happens in the future. So <clears throat> you get better at practices. In games, you can show what you can do. Then there's a lot of players, that, well, if, if I can't play anything, if I can't play any minutes, my confidence goes down. Yeah, I've been there. I understand it if you play just a couple minutes, but then it's coach's job to tell you, okay, hey, you're playing five minutes a game, but hey, 
here's kind of a situation in the game where you're going to come in. So get ready. Do great in those. So try to be, I can't remember who, who was the NBA person, coach, who says, that try to be an all-star player at that role that you've given. So if you're a guy who plays five minutes, try to be the best five-minute player, at least in that game. So I believe that, that practices are more important than games up to a certain level. But obviously, then after that, a certain age group, after that, what you do in games, that shows up in your bank account. And the bottom line is, money matters. It, it's a show business. Hockey, basketball, it's a show business. It's entertainment. And the people who are better, on average, make more money. It's good that you mentioned it because <coughs> I had Nicholas Beckstrom, an ex-NHL goalie here, sitting and he told me that he's always taking every practice as it is a game, like, like yeah. you said. So that's yeah. a very yeah. good example of that. Yeah, we had, yeah, I had a great assistant coach, Eric Musselman, who's now head coach at a University of Nevada. Um, he said, you know, who, who wants to be the MVP of this practice? And I don't, like, who wants to be the best player in this practice? It doesn't matter who is the best player in our team. It doesn't matter who is the starting five. Who is the best player in this practice? So if you go in every day trying to be the best player, your mentality is that. I think you can get better. Same way, if you go into a math class, 45 minutes. Are you going to be the best student at that math class? You're going to get better. And that's something, I, I mean, one of the things I, I truly learned from my college coach was, I mean, he's like, whatever you do, just try to do it 100%. Don't do anything half-ass, excuse me my language. You know, when you're in practice, go full out. You in classroom, go full out. If, if you're there, you have a double Swedish class, Monday morning, you're tired. You're still going to be there. Why don't you do the best job you can be? We can do rather than just sit there for two hours and learn nothing. But it's hard. It's mentally extremely hard. I, I truly, in, in my sport career, there's been about two and a half year period when I've been able to go pretty much full out every second of every practice. And that was in college. It took me about two years to learn it. But there was no, okay, now coaches are not watching. But it's, it's brutal. You need to be mentally and physically in unbelievable shape. Especially as long as practice we did. But then got, you got into professional sports. It was like, all right, well, I'm going to take some time off here because I need to rest. So, you know, when it matters, I can do this. And um, So it, it's hard. It, in team sports, it's hard because you don't, you're, the end result is not only on you. It, it also has a lot to do with the other four guys are doing or the other 11 guys or in hockey, other 20 some guys. So sometimes you feel like, ah, oh, you know what? We have no chance. So why? It, it's normal. It's like anybody goes to their normal office. Oh, it's a normal Tuesday morning. Okay, I'm going to do my job, but I'm not going to give it my all. You know, it happens. Well, we are back in Utah a little bit, and we are in Helsinki Basketball Academy. Also, you have the. Do you have the same idea that? Combining the school and the sport is very good because in America, there's always how people go to university, they go to college, they combine it and it's very well made that you get the diploma and also you're able to practice as much as possible. Well, obviously in States, the system is, the school system is built for that. But it's And if I could go back 100 years, that's the way I would plan the Finnish school and 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 recreational hobby system. I mean, how great would it be if if you have a third year old, a third grade son, he goes to school first, and then when school ends, let's say at two o'clock or three o'clock, he has a soccer practice right there in school backyard. And then at five, the parents can go and pick him up or, or he can go walk home, rather than going home and then at seven o'clock go somewhere. 
so it, it's it's a lot easier and it's the same thing whether you, it's a piano lessons or track and field everything in stage is a majority of things are built around the school system so we in the, with the in the basketball we're trying to bring sport where learning is happening naturally which is a school environment it, it's very important for us it, basketball is a very academic sport it was founded by a university professor for university students to enhance their team building skills and and all sorts of things um, and it's also a sport that you you need to be a uh, pretty smart to to uh, be able to play at, at a higher level on average um, some say it's the second most tactical team sport after American football I don't know if it's true or not but it's uh, it really depends on coach kind of how com com complicated it's, it's made but um, we do value academics a lot we don't if you have if you have trouble in school if you don't go to class you know you can't you can't play a practice with us so uh, and a lot of our guys want to go to college after high school these days it's something that we encourage as a as a in the Finnish basketball federation because we see as a great next step to develop mentally and physically the next four years okay Laura Markkanen's case it was only one year but pretty much everybody else it's going to be four years because as Finn we're biologically on average we're we maybe come a year behind some southern Europeans I mean if you take an 18 year old Turkish guy and an 18 year old Finnish guy usually the Turkish guy is a little more built is more masculine already so he gives us more time to play with not junior sports anymore but play with the guys of same age 18 to 23 24 and rather than being thrown into the cold waters of professional basketball where your guy next sitting next to you in the locker room might be 35 year old Croatian whose only job is to basically beat you up so he can get the next contract and then you get your academics. I mean, I'm, I'm extremely proud that I have a bachelor degree in economics. Um, you know, it gives you some kind of base. You never know if, if injury happens or you just run out of gas or you're not good enough in basketball. You still have that something to lean on. So you can go full out in sports and then get your academic career started as well after high school. So I think, and I, I, I've said it, I think college sports is the most underused and probably underappreciated resources in Finnish sports because the doors are open for everybody. You don't need to be a national junior national team player to get a college full no full scholarship. There's, for example, in basketball, there's over a thousand different colleges, different levels. They all hand out basically full scholarships. When I was at Utah, we had golf and tennis players from Sweden and Denmark and Norway and all, but we didn't have any Finns. Um, now there's a Finnish girl basketball player at Utah. They used to be a couple of downhill skiers. Um, but, and we, yes, the, the, the guys or the girls, they're away for four years. Okay, they come back in the summer so they can represent the national teams during the summer. Mm -hmm. But we we think that when they come back three or four years later, it's going to be a lot better for the Finnish basketball. And uh, for that reason, we have over 20 girls in college right now. And I think we have 13 boys or 14. And another another group of guys are going to leave next fall from HBA. You think it's also important because there's crowd, there's people watching, and as you said, there's media. They are asking questions that you learn those basics right away, and then when there's huge audience, it doesn't affect you that much. Oh, absolutely. And I'm not saying that the level of basketball in all those thousand programs is better than Kores Liga. I'm not saying that. It's not. But on average, that is the first time, and it might be the only time. That you are gonna feel like you are an athlete. We think we're athletes here in Finland, but the culture is not embracing athletes. Everything there is built for athletes. Facilities are five star. Um, 
I mean, for example, Utah's athletic budget is, <laughs> I want to say is not, now it's probably north or a little north of 60 million, probably getting, they, I think they want to shoot for about 85. They're competing with schools of over $100 million budgets. Um, so even if for four years, a Finnish girl or a boy can experience that, have a unbelievable facilities, just on those experiences, they can carry you for the rest of your life. Rather than, okay, you stay here in Finland and you, you might even become a little bit better, say, a basketball player, if you're getting the right situation. I still take the college experience. You can always come back here and play in front of 950 people in a high school gym. But you can, that's something that's special. So, um, um, I mean, I, I was lucky. There's, there's a lot of, just like there's bad experiences when you go to Southern Europe and play basketball or play hockey, there's great experiences. I was lucky. I, I had an unbelievable experience, had a chance to play with unbelievable players. So I know it's, it's not a, it's not a <laughs> automatically great experience. We have a lot of our guys right now. They're not getting playing minutes, but then the first thing we got to do is look in, look in the mirror. You're not good enough. Simple as that. You know, maybe the parents want to say, okay, the, this coaching staff is this and this, or the system is bad. Coaches at that level, they want to win. They play the guys who are most capable of helping them to win. It's simple as that. Yeah, this is how it should be, I guess. <laughs> but they're, they're professional coaches yeah, and it, they need to it is, be yes, successful. Yes, so. at college level, it is professional sports. And I mean, and the budgets are as they are. A lot of our guys, they get they get paid. Their monthly checks are, I mean, they're pretty. They're pretty good. I mean, you get a, you get you get enough money to uh, you know have a good life there. So it, it is a it is professional sports without great salaries. It, it is, and, and uh, winning matters. If coaches are making a million, two million. Their job, yes, they want to develop the players in the four-year span, but right here, right now, their job is to win a game. Whether how that coaching staff does it, you know that that varies. Whether they play ten guys or they play seven guys or eight guys, but it's still winning matters. Those ups and downs are a big big thing in sports said you win something and next game you lose and you feel bad and then you're up there again and you think it helps you out and the players and the athletes in their life later when they learn to cope with these situations that there's a lot of ups and downs and you get to big highs and really low lows absolutely and I, you know I, you know I, I was never individual athlete so i can't imagine how brutal it is to have those downs as a individual athlete because it's all on you there's no one else to blame. There's no one else to. Yes, you can talk to your your coaches or or, or other, the people who do the same sport as you, but still, they don't go through that exact same thing in team sports. You in that locker room and 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 is at those times when teams are struggling that the chemistry is kind of built. It's easy. Winning hides all the problems. Losing brings them up, and that's how you can solve. Um, solve a lot of those issues, but yeah, I think if I was a business owner, I would look to hire athletes in a heartbeat. And again, I said, okay, I said earlier in the podcast, there's too many studies done. Common sense should be used, but I know there's studies done that athletes are great workers in a normal, normal uh, working environment. You know, we learn to uh, handle different situations. I mean, my my normal job day, my my presentation was uh, in front of twenty thousand people who might have been booing at me, and then whether I did good or not was written in the next day's paper. So that's a pressure. If 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 someone who working in the office has to give a presentation to fifty people about their new product, yes, it's a pressure, but it's a different kind. No one, there's not a old Turkish lady trying to throw you with the coin or booing you or, you know, so I think athletes are ready to 
um, work under pressure and also be great great people in in that working community that environment i think especially team athletes we know how what good chemistry means how you build it and also how you break it you know i've had a lot of teammates who they're great they they could have been great on the court but they're just a cancer in a locker room yeah i've seen that too many many times yeah let's go back to your career a little bit we were in europe and Spain was a disappointment, but after that you continued. And what was the next step after that? I had a couple of really good years in in Italy, um, and again, um, because of the experience in uh, in Spain, I didn't want to I didn't want to sign a multi year contract. Bologna, where I, where I went to, they wanted to sign me for multiple years. Um, so that was kind of one thing that affected again my future career because I was so hesitant to trust people I, I didn't know what kind of place I was going into um, so um, uh, that, that Bologna team was great we, we got to a EuroLeague final four to a final game but then we uh, we were in in Tel Aviv playing Tel Aviv Maccabi and uh, from the warm-up on you kind of sense that there was something special in the air and uh, about two hours later you know there was a scoreboard show that we lost by 44 points the EuroLeague final so uh, that was a uh, it was one of those things uh, I don't know if it was religious or whatever it was there's absolutely nothing because we we dominated the same team month before um, we just got caught on the them home court the EuroLeague final um, so, uh, so I've been able to experience the NCAA final, four final, and a EuroLeague final. Um, didn't win either, uh, but uh, still great experiences. You think it affects you if you think about the result too much when you go on the game. Same if you think about the the future, like if I play this game and that game very good, and then I'm gonna be maybe in NBA or wherever, but. Like you earlier mentioned, that focus on the specific moment is very important. Yeah, uh, it absolutely does. And and after I left college, I I did. I don't know if struggle is the right word, but I did. It did affect me for sure. Um, in that going into that final four, I was like, okay, if I play well now, I know there's a lot of NBA scouts. Maybe I can, you know, maybe I get an offer from NBA again. So yeah, it was again. It was kind of became individualistic goal. Although we were going to win this, the second highest trophy in in team basketball, other than national teams. So um, sure, but but it's natural. But I I played again. I played with some Americans who, when they come to Europe, they they, they don't know the difference between Spain and Italy or Greece and and Germany. They have no clue the teams, clubs we go play against. They might have heard about Barcelona, Real Madrid, but they just go and play. And I, I absolutely envy that. I, I wish I could have just go and just empty my head and just go and play. They win or lose, they just go and play. And that's something, Americans are a lot more stress-free in that way. But also thing is they're, they're taught or they're putting in the situation from middle school where it is a lot more individualistic. When they're freshmen in college, our ninth grade, college teams are already looking at them. They go watch their games. They play these AAU tournaments where the main goal is to look good in front of 100 college coaches and then get a scholarship. That is the only purpose. When our purpose is uh, we're trying to develop the players and make them as future national team players. In the States, the only, basically the only goal at high school level, especially during the summer, the AAU circuit, is to look good for college coaches and get a scholarship. So they, they've learned to think about me, myself and I a lot earlier than we are. 
if we ever are. So they're a lot more stress-free. They just go and play. They do what coaches ask, but they're they go and they go and get stress-free and go get their own. They shoot, they score. Hey, we lose. Hey, let's go to the next place. Are we getting my check on time? Good. Next month comes. Where I'm a person who thinks after a loss, or if I play bad, not even after a loss, if I play bad, I'm struggling mentally so bad until the next practice. So worst thing that happened to me in my career was if I had a bad game and then coach gave us two days off, I was the worst husband and a father to our kids the next two days. Cause I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying not to show it, but my wife knows I'm, I'm, I'm miserable. Then I need to go to the next practice and have a great practice to kind of, okay, I am a pretty good basketball player. So yeah, I, I, uh, I did fight mentally that kind of aspects during my pro career for sure. And then in the NBA, because my agent told me, you need to shoot every time you catch the ball. I'm like, what? Well, I can't do it. My, my brain does not function that way. And then if I miss a shot, I was like, ah, oh, you know, why am I missing shots? And so, um, I really, I mean, I, I idolize some of those American players who can just go and play. They don't, they don't care about what happened five seconds before or five seconds in the future. They just, they are in the moment. It kind of feels like it's built in us, but you think we can change, put it all around and help the future generations on this? Well, I think Lauro Markkanen is a, is a great example that, that this generation can change because he's in a situation where he needs to and he does shoot every time he gets the ball. And I, I, I need, it's great. From our standpoint, if you if you would act like that in European basketball, you would be extremely selfish. But that's exactly what he's supposed to do, and people love it, and 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 I love it. Um, uh, but yeah, we do need to. I, I call them the Finnish sports team sports. We build uh, Jere Lehtinen type of athletes, guys who are great offensively, defensively. Everything is, they're probably the most important players in the team, but no one considers them the absolute superstar. Although Jere Lehtinen was a, one unbelievable hockey player. But what he's known for, great two-way player. Didn't have a weakness. Well, that's kind of how we are. Tell me from a Finnish soccer team, tell me one great goal scorer. Never even been. Jare Littmanen was an unbelievable motor, skill-wise. But you put one uh, Ruud van Nistelrooy to our, our national team. We would have played in the last five world championships. But now we have the ho ho young hockey players who start become great goal scorers. I mean, Teemu Selänen was a, a nor something out of very ordinary. Yeah. Be because, but he's such a great guy, personality, great with media. No one has ever called him a selfish. But you know, if we, I, I remember, I was, I was a exchange student when he was a uh, his rookie year. I look, I mean, he was there, waiting at the half in the blue at the red line. Didn't care about defense too much, and boom, other way around and sc scored a goal. That was his job. So yes, we do need to somehow teach our our athletes that <laughs> you need to have selfish, because in our language, selfish. Selfishness has a very negative tone. But in a lot of professional sports, you need to be selfish to help yourself and the team. Um, so uh, it's it's a tricky it's a tricky thing because then in our national team, but in hockey or 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 basketball or or soccer, we're never going to have the absolutely most skilled and the best players on the court on ice but our power comes from playing together so when you play for a national team you need to be that a fin but when you go and represent yourself whether it's college or or professional sports you need to throw that a little bit in in a, in a trash can and be something else yeah. 
the, the proud Finn individual. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, we had the Finnish flags here, and it said about the national team also. You have a, had a great, a huge uh, career as a national team player. And you said earlier in the talk that it has changed. Since 19 years, uh, let's say the whole na nation knows basketball very well now. Like I said, Bill Bauer, 10,000 spectators went all the way there from Finland. How did it feel that this big amount of people came to see you play? Our team. As we used to say, we always say our team is successful, yeah. our team, then you lose, but whatever. So it was emotional to see that 10,000 people come from Finland all the way to Bilbao to watch the games. Yeah, I mean, personally, I knew going in that that's, that's going to be the end of my career. So it was a... Uh... Um, it was pretty cool. I mean, in, on and off the court, to be able to be pretty big part of the Finnish basketball, seeing it from a bottom, you know, yes, we, I started my career at the European Championships, but then we took a head and nose dive deep down for years and then be part of that, the rise to uh, not top of Europe, but we are knocking on the door. It's been special and it really fulfilled my kind of my career. If, if I didn't experience this last four or five years of my, my career with the national team, I would kind of feel empty. Um, and that's a national team was a reason why I came back and after not playing that one, one professional season, I came back the next summer, national team was the reason. Because I was addicted to the crowd. It was the reason, I mean, it was the motivating for my last few years in EuroLeague, playing in front of the big crowds. That was that was the biggest motivation. And I think if you ask a lot of the older athletes, that is the biggest, it's, it's a drug. It literally is a drug. Um, so to be able to play again, again in front of a lot of big crowds, it, it was fulfilling and obviously that Bilbao was something something special that 10,000 families kids grandparents traveled there in September when school was already going so it wasn't like a summer holiday trip um, it was special on a basketball court it was a worse basketball we we played in probably the previous five years uh, I still can't get over it I accept, accepted it, but we should have been in the quarterfinals, at least. But we blew it. It was ourselves. Us players, coaching staff, no questions asked. We just didn't perform when we needed to. But to be able to go from playing against Luxembourg in the European B level qualifications in Reykjavik to playing against Dream Team USA in front of 15,000 people, 10,000 Finns, you know, I, I felt pretty good. I've, I've done my job on the court for Finnish basketball. And now part of my job is to fill that senior national team, help these young kids as an assistant coach at the HBA. So hopefully our goal is that in a few years, you know, most of the national team is going to be guys who came through our program. Because already on that team, there was, I think, seven or eight players who played who were from Macalarina Sports High School uh, and went to college. So it's just a normal continuation of that, but we try to, so, you know, because already we have, for example, last summer we had 10 out of 12 players at the, at the under 18 European Championships were from HBA. So uh, hopefully we keep on doing a good job, but we're just as good as the players are. So if we don't get talent in, it's tough to, uh, or tough to uh, shape a diamonds out of a, uh, out of a, uh, just the uh, normal rocks. Talent versus work. Which one, or are they hand in hand? You need both. In today's basketball, you need more talent. Back in the day, you were able to get by with great work ethics. But if you look at today's basketball on the top and the NBA those athletes are absolutely incredible uh, 
because basketball is is probably one of the few sports that you need you need to be able to master basically every kind of movement. You have a vertical movement, horizontal. You need to be quick and light, but at the same time, you need to have very good core strength and upper body. Your legs need to. So it, it's it's a tough sport to master. So yes, you need to have a God-given talent physically these days. Uh, but there's a lot of great athletes that start playing basketball. Unbelievable athletes. So only only a fraction of those great athletes can make it to a top. What makes a difference as a young player? Who makes it and who doesn't? There's of course there a lot of things, but if you think about what are the biggest reasons? Well, the starting point have to be that talent. Doesn't matter how much you love basketball, how if you don't have the size, okay, you don't need to be that big anymore. It's funny thing is that the basketball height demand 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 for great height is is kind of lowering. It, it, NBA is getting a little bit shorter, I think. You don't have a big, you don't have a huge seven footers that many of them anymore. The centers are becoming a little bit shorter. Um, there's a demand for speed, so you need to have a certain amount of height with great physical talent, and then it's it's work ethic, and between your years. I've had a lot of teammates who are physically, skill-wise, unbelievable. But if you can't remember five different plays, set play, it's tough to play. Um, so you might be great on the street ball, playing one-on-one. -on -one, but in organized basketball, if coaches, that's what coaches demand. You need to have a good, uh, good brain, <laughs> brain for basketball, if that's the expression. Um, but yeah, it's, you need to have a great work ethic, but it doesn't help if you don't have physical talent. What about passion? Do you need to be passionate in your sport? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I think Laura Markkanen is, is a great example. He absolutely loves basketball. He's lived his life for basketball probably since first grade. Um, for him, he hasn't sacrificed anything in his in his head when he hasn't gone to the Friday night parties with high school buddies or or in eighth grade. For him, it was lifestyle, and it, it, uh, now you can see the result. And this is just a kind of start of it. I mean, he's I can't wait what he's in five years. So yes, you need to have passion for it. You need to care about it. And you need to care about your teammates in the right way. You need to have that lick of that little, little bit of that selfishness that we talked about. But it's a team sport. You still need to be able to play within the team rules, help your teammates out. Um, so it's a. Uh, we have, even though we don't have a great number of basketball players in Finland, a little under 20,000, just in my coaching career, which is now six years running, I've seen a lot of players who are missing, missing just one of those key elements. Whether it's that guy has unbelievable work ethic, passion, height, touch, but he's just an average athlete. Or that guy is an unbelievable athlete, has a, has a passion for it, has skills for it, but just something doesn't click within his head. So, uh, but then when you have a million or two million basketball players like some of these countries, you know, you don't have to care about those individuals. Just take the ones you know have everything. But we, we need to develop every single high level talent we have. And um, you can you can come by, you can become a really good professional player without obviously having all the tools needed. But the ceiling is somewhere. Like I, for myself, I think this my ceiling was that within my head, I didn't understand how could I could be or how could I use all the skills that I have. That was the that was the ceiling that I, I put on myself. What is your message to the younger players about sleep and nutrition? 
again, common sense. Uh, I know there's great studies, but we live in Finland. Resources are limited for for athletes. We would at, at Matasku, we would love to have a catered meal after every practice. We don't have the money for that. Um, so players need to understand that the breakfast is huge, lunch is huge, dinner is huge, and what do you put in your mouth? Not try to stay away from sugar, you know. Common sense for high school level, yes, we can give them all kinds of different studies. Oh, you do this, but it doesn't go through. So we do, we have a, uh, we have a great partner um, at Arctic Nutrition, Finnish company who gives he gives all the uh, needed uh, vitamins and, and uh, mineral stuff for our players. So that's what we can give them. The rest is, is on their own. And we try to educate their parents. Um, and uh, you know, there's always time for, if you need fast food here and there, if you train well, sleep well, eat well, yeah, go ahead and have a, have a hamburger here and there. Um, but um, it's huge. I mean, it's, and older you get, you realize it. And in the second part kind of my career, I truly understood it. When I came back, when I, I didn't play for almost six months, I um, I went just on a pretty strict diet and training. I went to, I got to about 2009, went from 100, I, I, was, I blew up to about I was probably 112, 113, 14 kilos when I started my training in, in March for the next summer's national team camp. And in June, I was down to 99 and half kilos, 4.6 body fat. And I was 30, what was, I, what I was, 33 at the time, 34. So you can do it at any age if you want it. But with these high school kids, it's common sense. We do get, we do talk to them. We have a person in our staff who is kind of responsible for that. But again, different families have different resources and we try to help them. It's been a great talk so far. Thank you so much for coming. But I have a couple of more questions for you. And first one is, uh, what are your keys to success? How come have you been so successful basketball player? I think I, I wanted it more than my teammates and best friends did. Although at the time I didn't understand it, but I, I did the right at the right time, I, I I made the right decisions. Um, for example, you know I, I quit my my exchange student year after seven months and came back home to try for the national team. Um, I was brave enough to go to college. Um, so I, I think it was just something that guided me. Um, and then you know looking back. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on outdoor courts on my own shooting and playing in the Los Angeles Lakers against Boston Celtics and, you know, being Magic Johnson on my own head. And so I, I did a lot of sports. That's probably the one thing. Um, and then my parents allowed me to be who I am. They didn't take me to one practice. We didn't have a car, but they didn't take me to one practice. They didn't ask or they did not talk to my coaches about my playing time. They they let me, it was my hobby. They came to watch my games here and there, but it was my hobby. It was not something, they didn't live their missed opportunity through me. So I think basketball was my thing. So I, I give a lot of credit to my parents who, they enjoyed that I did well, but it wasn't that, I didn't need them at my every game. Do you think basketball more as a sport or as a way of living? It's a sport that has has shaped the way uh, I live and the people I associate myself with. I don't have, I'm trying to think if I have any friends who I have that are not because of basketball one way or the other some you know maybe a one a really really good friend of mine who i grew up with from kindergarten on uh but but even though know, he's a he played with me in basketball in the same team with my my brother and, and he was a hockey player later on and 
but yeah, it, basketball has shaped who I am, and and but it's not it it shaped who I am, but but still, you know, it it doesn't dictate what I do in life every day. It it, it taught me what I should do, but uh, I don't see myself anymore as a you know now I'm, I'm a coach and I'm a you know person who can uh, uh, enjoy life and and uh, use those those things that I learned because of basketball in my everyday life. If you would now be able to make a phone call and call that 20-year-old Hanno, what would you tell him? Um, Business-wise, I would tell him that I'd leave college after sophomore or junior year and go to the NBA. <laughs> you know, but back then I wasn't, it was, you know, I wasn't thinking that way. Um, to be brave enough to think, to, um, to play with a little more edge and be a little more um, open-minded, you know, uh, try to get the best out of what you taught in college, but still, still use that inner whatever it is that I had before I went to college. That uh, that um, I don't know what's even a word. Uh, I had the freedom in my mind that I can do everything on the court. Um, so that that's something I missed and I, I kind of never got it back but yes I became a whole lot better basketball player on the other aspects but I still here and there I was able to bring that that uh, younger self out on the court and play just freely final question here at Surfer of Life I also like to enjoy living and life and What are the things? What is the thing that makes you happy every day? Well, I have a unbelievable three kids, unbelievable wife who stood by me for uh, you know from second year in college on. Um, and no, I'm I'm happy to see my my family is doing well. Um, you know, it's it's uh, when I go home. These days, yes, I, I do work at home. I, I watch game film. I think about this, you know. But when I was playing, I had to go home and I was thinking about basketball 24-7. As a, if I didn't play well, it affected me. But now, when I go home, I can be with the family emotionally. And then when I work at home, in you know, my office, you know, I can do that. So um, it makes me happy. I'm, I'm living. I have a best, absolutely best coaching job in Finland. We get to work with the best players, and um, you know, I, I, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy that it's 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 almost December. Um, I might be crazy, but I, I love when it gets dark outside. I maybe live enough in a sunny, sunny environments that I love when it gets dark. I know a lot of people say that now we're supposed to get depressed. I know the tabloids going to have a headlines that now we're supposed to get depressed, and but I love it. You know, you put some candles on. You know, it's. Uh, I'm starting to, be, you know, I become the po really, really positive person that I was as a teenager. Then the the professional life kind of twitches you one way. So I, I liking where I'm going as a person and uh, try to get better every day. I like that. Hey, Hanna, thank you so much for coming. All right. Yeah. Thank you.